Hey everyone, you know it's that time again. As always, it's Friday, which means it's time to deploy. Joining me again, as always, is Jim. How was your week? Yeah, great week down here. Doing really well. How are you? Good, good. Uh, I had a great offsite with uh, some folks on my team. Uh, we had some folks fly over from the UK, and uh, uh, we spent the last three days uh, at HQ talking about upcoming plans. Uh, nothing we can reveal yet, but uh, it was great to meet them face to face for the first time for some of them. And for others, it was great to reconnect. So uh, we're in this digital remote world now. So yeah. meeting people face to face is a is a pleasant uh, rarity. So that was good for me. You get to find out how tall people actually are. That's right. That's the that's the one thing that doesn't come across on camera. <laughs> it's like, oh, that person is actually a lot taller than I realized. I'm heading up a little while myself, so I'm looking forward to to seeing everyone. Oh, perfect, excellent. So if you're having to stumble upon a show, this is the uh, show that Jim and I go through the news of the week related to Octopus. And to kick things off, uh, I'd like to start by the CD Foundation, for those who aren't aware, is a um, collection of open source projects, companies, etc. that are promoting um, basically, you know, the rapid delivery of software uh, through continuous deployment and delivery. And so there's a variety of resources there. One of those resources is the State of Continuous Delivery Report, which was recently updated. Uh, this is something that's been uh, published in a number of years. And Steve Fenton, uh, obviously a friend of, of ours, uh, recently wrote this blog post highlighting some of the key observations that were made. So the report itself um, basically talks about uh, the CD space, the continuous delivery space, talks about you know what companies are doing. And so the some of the highlights that are mentioned here, so first one, speed is stability. So of uh, one of the key insights in the state of CD reports that there is a link between speed and stability. The link between those two is strong. So when you work in small batches and deploy early and often, you'll also handle outages well. 30% of high performers of code change lead times were also high performers for service restoration. That makes sense. I mean, like, you know, you're constantly delivering. Uh, this is one of the benefits, of course, of continuous delivery. I, I would imagine you won't argue with this one, eh, Jim? Definitely not. Roll forward, roll forward quickly. Yep. Is Are you a big believer in the train is always moving forward? Or <laughs> are you one of these uh, people who, you know... I've, I've been found it works well. I have okay. been, tend to found it works well. Um, although this finding was counterintuitive originally, uh, the relationship is solid. And I, I, I think it makes sense for me. I mean, if you're shipping often and early, to me, that's been, my, that's been both my personal experience as well as my experience with teams that I've been on. Um, that tends to be the case that you're able to basically reconcile or restore services that may go down. So uh, yeah. you should be confident that the steps to speed up your CD, CI CD pipeline will benefit your instant management capability too. It's that one change, right? It's always the one small change that make, has a problem. <laughs> so if you can right. ship through that change quickly, you're back to, you're back to good state. A hundred percent. Another highlight that Steve mentions is shift left and automate security checks. Uh, shift left is this notion that says basically, um, if you think of the spectrum of you know CI CD, shift left is this notion that you want to move more towards the developer end of things. Which you know if if the right side of it is more towards automation, the left side and there's automation involved, for example, and it's systems based, etc. And then the left side is more towards where the developers are within their tool set. Uh, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So shift left and automate security checks. So security testing is crucial for modern software de delivery. Performing automated checks early in the process is the key to development velocity. I would agree with that. Most organizations understand the value of security testing in protecting their reputation. Security testing is now the second most common DevOps activity after monitoring. That is interesting. Wow, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Monitoring is easily number one, yes, for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's been a rise, there's been a sort of surge in the tooling around that space too recently, right? You know, like two, three years ago, two, three years ago, you didn't have a lot of static analysis or like security testing tools, but now you do. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the canonical one I think of always is Sneak, um, but uh, there are many others as well. Um, yeah. So definitely, definitely with um, securing supply chains and all that, I think that's kind of elevated its status there. Use automated build time checks to catch security problems early without slowing development velocity. Yep. So again, that shift left mentality. Beyond web applications, continuous delivery and DevOps aren't just for web applications. Duh. 
Uh, the report found high adoption rates for DevOps practices across many sectors, such as industrial IoT or in Internet of Things, embedded software, third-party apps and extensions, and consumer electronics. DevOps activities are also common in teams developing desktop apps, mobile apps, and games. Not surprising. Yep. 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 We see a lot of that. Teams, yep. Teams in yep. this uh, in these sectors must find ways to minimize disruption, efficiently use resources such as network and storage, and manage external approvals like app store checks. I would also say, like, you know, when we talk about ITSM, uh, there are a variety of solutions out there as well that comes into effect, you know, who issued this build, etc., things like that. Build cohesive tool chains. The report found that using a broad set of DevOps-related technology improved performance. Using a single technology made it more likely for a team to fall within low uh, within the low performance group. This is interesting. So that is those, interesting. Yeah, those catch-all solutions that do everything and make toast and and fold your laundry. Uh, those tend not to be as successful with teams. For example, teams using ten plus technologies to form a cohesive tool chain were likelier to be in the top performing group. So hmm. that's a combination of best in practice. So, you know, uh, Git for source control, GitHub for possibly code sharing, uh, obviously Octopus for deployment, um, security testing via something like Sneak, for example, monitoring via Datadog or Splunk or Sumo or utilizing um, metrics via Prometheus or Grafana, uh, and then IDE management, you know, what are you using for there, and tools on the shift left train, etc. So that makes total sense. The average number of technologies was 4.5, which is below the optimal number found in the report. If you have fewer than tech technolo 10 technologies, you can look at the software delivery and operations workflow. They can support to find gaps. Do you have tools to assist in the following workflows? For example, blah, 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 blah. When the tools don't integrate well, they may negatively impact performance, 100%. So my experience having uh, co-run the integration team at Octopus Deploy for the last two plus years, uh, we believe in this strongly. We are better together. We need to work well with others, play nicely. So smooth integration between tools becomes more critical as you add more technologies to your tool chain. So these and other observations that Steve has graciously summarized are in the State of Continuous Delivery Report, which you can find up on the CD Foundation website, which is at cd.foundation. And yes, dot .foundation is a TLD. So there you go. You know, was there any surprises based on this summary or is there anything that you would imagine uh, would be part of this? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the thing that surprised me the most was the, um, the different tool sets led to a higher performing chain. Like, I, it, may, it makes sense now that I think about it, right? So we've used the best in breed. Nothing does everything yep. really well. Yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they can take some, they definitely can take some effort to integrate though as well. So it'd be interesting yep. to see. I'd be really interested to know what the, the top sort of combinations of tool chains were, to be honest. I think those are listed in some of the report. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll leave it to um, the folks who published the report to share that information. Um, the report, I believe, was compiled by Slash Data and published via the CD Foundation. So you can find it there. And uh, we have a link on it for this show. So go ahead and check it out. I know you like Visual Studio. I know you're still sticking with Rider, but I know you like Visual <laughs> Studio nonetheless. Um, Microsoft Fluent is a design language that was introduced years and years ago. I don't know if you remember, but it came out a while back and it came on the coattails of an office redesign, if I remember my history correctly. And it looks like the UI for Visual Studio is getting a bit of a bump or a bit of a refresh or a new uh, smattering of paint, so to speak. And so this is a blog post that I uh, read earlier that talks a little bit about how the design team around Visual Studio is looking to make changes to align better to Microsoft Fluent. And so they provide some examples here. They're kind of hard to see, but you can see one example here where the traditional or old toolbar is on the top, the new one that they're proposing on the bottom. Now, I know, Jim, you're blown away by this change. Like, you know, contain your excitement. Staggering. Staggering. You know. <laughs> but things like this where you maximize width, um, thereby removing clutter, etc., uh, so another example on the left, we have the VS 20, uh, sorry, the VS 17.6 menu on the right, we have the proposed menu. So you can see a little bit of difference in spacing, um, some simplicity on the, you know, lot, a lot less sort of options, you know, less is more, I guess, is the philosophy there. 
Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. a little bit more contrast as well. Active region styling. So to provide an example, I know, again, Jim, you're just blown away by this, but you can see how the drop downs are a little bit bigger and they've got some smooth edges. It looks like we're oh, going yeah. back to the it looks like we're going back to the bevel B2B yeah. back to the bevel. So, yeah, it looks like looks like they're adding some changes there. These are subtle, subtle changes, but I, I, I'm encouraged by this. I think anything that can help make something a little bit more visually appealing. You know, Visual Studio has gone through a number of maturations in terms of its design. You may remember back in the day uh, of uh, well, certainly I do of you know, Visual Basic and Visual C++ and InnerDev and all these other tools. And then we have Visual Studio 2002, 2003, 2005, 2008, 2010. And each progressive release, and we had theme support and all this stuff, each progressive release added more and more complexity to the UI. It looks like they're moving back to something a little bit more simpler based around Fluent, which I'm encouraged by. So if you're at all interested to find out more, you can check out this blog post entitled Visual Studio UI Refresh. Nice. This is another survey that uh, was made known to me. Um, this one kind of, uh, I think this hit our internal Slack and we read through this one. The title of this is What's Trending in DevOps? Today's Challenges and How to Overcome Them. Uh, so this was written by the Chief Global Head of Delivery at Nutcash. I don't know what that is, a tireless advocate of women in technology. Cool. Um, so in today's, okay, intro, intro, intro. Okay, here's the list. <laughs> so it's, it's like one of those things like, let's just get to the list. Okay. Number one, the rise of low code and no code platforms. Uh, that makes some sense. Um, I don't know if it makes sense in the, in the world of shift left espousing that, but certainly this, this notion that I think DevOps teams want to incorporate more folks into the notion of a pipeline and workflows and CI, CD, et cetera. Low code and no code will certainly help in that regard. I know that speaking for myself, we've used solutions like Workado and Zapier. These are workflow solutions that uh, help us stitch together systems. Um, those are definitely low code, no code solutions. I, I would I would frame this as more like workflow engines or workflow solutions to help you stitch together services that weren't meant to talk to each other. So have you used anything like that? Workado, Zapier, these workflow engines? I've used engines? Zapier before, little yeah. bits and pieces like that. Um, I'm generally a bit hesitant to use any of the larger low code, no code platforms. Um, I think they can be- Power you know, builder, can really things like that. Yeah, they can be really good for maybe a proof of concept, but um, keeping something like that in production, I mean, there's not often not any kind of automation around the the the, the life cycle of those no code, low code, no code platforms, right? Yep. Right. Yeah. Number two, a focus on security and compliance. Well, duh. <laughs> um, number three, serverless architecture adoption. This one I don't agree with. Uh, in fact, I read something earlier today that. Uh, I believe Amazon or someone to that effect said that serverless is, I think it was Amazon Prime is, is I, I could be getting this wrong, is is there's a move away from serverless. Uh, this one I don't think is is on the rise. I think people have found this to be problematic and difficult to manage. What's been your observation with this? I've heard similar similar rumblings begin. Uh, I'm th I think it's at the start of it, but I think you know we're at the start of those rumblings and I can understand why. I think the pro the proliferation and management of large fleets of serverless, in, you know, architecture has become quite tricky for some people um, who've really gone all all in on it. Yep. Um, yep. But yeah. And before adoption of containerization, I would say this is probably number two, not number four. Um, containers are everywhere. Kubernetes is certainly driving that, but um, you know. This is certainly espoused heavily in the DevOps space. Number five, automating manual processes. Well, of course, number six, increased focus on observability and monitoring. Like just we just read in the previous report from the CD Foundation and Slash Data that uh, observability is the number one tool chain that's targeted in an automation context. So makes total sense. Increased adoption of GitOps. Now, we don't use a great deal of GitOps at Octopus. We use it sparingly. Uh, there are ways in which you can use GitOps in terms of that. So for those who aren't aware, GitOps is basically the most practical definition or loose definition that I can think of with GitOps is everything's a thread in Git, in Git like for example, Git, GitLab or GitHub, and that you operate or manage your pipeline via commands in that thread. So it's an issue, you com issue commands, like using an Octopus example, I could create a release um, through a command as, a, as part of a uh, thread in an issue. 
things like that. And the idea there is you maintain your flow, what they call GitHub flow or something to that effect, where rather than leaving a tool and doing something other, uh, like, you know, esoteric to a particular tool chain or something with GitOps, you can stay within one tool and you can do all your maintenance, your operations, et cetera, within a Git flow. Um, I don't know if this is going to take off or not. This is certainly espoused with solutions like Argo CD and tool chains that um, push that narrative. Um, it is something I, I know we're looking at, for example. But um, yeah, what are your thoughts on this? I've really enjoyed working like this in the past. Um, even even sort of taking it a step further towards source control and actually having everything as a tag or a label on a source control repository to manage all of, you know, deploying and stuff like that. I mean, it's been, yeah, I found it super, um, super, super, once you get into the flow, very productive. Um, yep. but the, um, the learning curve's high because it's always yes. going to be a custom, a custom setup. You need to know exactly all the nuances of the little f workflow you've set up. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, number eight adoption of edge computing. Well, okay. So that's what's trending in DevOps. Um, so that's an article you can check out from Forbes. Another one that um, we're, we're all about the reports and pulse surveys today. So DevOps Pulse 2023 observability trends and challenges. Talking about cloud native complexity is contributing to the increased increasing MTTR of production issues. So mean time to recovery or MTTR is this notion of how long does it take to get back up to, you know, working production. This is a report that was written by logs.io, very popular solution uh, used heavily in the Kubernetes space, for example. The DevOps Pulse is a survey that's done, con uh, conducted annually of DevOps industry trends. Uh, it's done by logs. And in this survey, they have the highlights. So they do basically some of the highlights here. So knowledge and adoption of DevOps practices and now cloud native technologies is progressing at a consistent rate. So fair enough. Mean time to recovery or MTTR is a key metric of a, for observability efficiency and has been steadily increasing within organizations. That is 100% true. While observability practices are maturing at a consistent pace, the complexity of cloud native technologies is inhibiting further progress. 100%. Kubernetes, 1000%. This is part of the reason why you have solutions like EKS, AKS, um, you know, the, the solutions that are basically trying to make uh, Kubernetes a little bit simpler. Um, this is definitely a, this is definitely the case with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is is very difficult, I think, and very difficult to wrap to wrap your head around in some cases. So um, observing that obviously can be a challenge. The integration of security alongside observability practices is growing is a growing concern. Uh, I guess a concern meaning they're, they're thinking about it. Like, what are we doing around security? I guess that's what they mean. The data shows that observability teams are major stakeholders in the security of their applications and tools, with over 72% of respondents already employing or planning to enlist a unified model for observability and security. Okay. So maybe those two worlds will cross over like a Venn diagram. We'll see. And then finally, open source tools are growing in popularity. Over 93% of respondents now utilize them for observability. That makes sense. I mean, you've got solutions like OpenTelemetry, you've got you know, logs.io, you've got any number of observability solutions out there. You've got Raygun, you've got uh, Datadog, you've got Splunk, you've got Sumo, you've got blah, 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 you know. So um, so they go into a deep sort of dive of, you know, the state of observability. Um, so you can see some of the charts and graphs there. So I won't bore you with all the details, but um, this is yet another report that talks about these things. Increasing MTDR, always a good thing. Uh, if you ever go down, you want to make sure you're back up as quickly as you can. Of course, you want to stay up. <laughs> you don't want to just be like up and down, up and down, up and down. So um, so only 14% of organizations are satisfied with their MTTR for production issues. I would imagine it would probably be lower than that. I don't think anyone's satisfied <laughs> with going down <laughs> in the first place. Yeah, totally. What's your team's current mean time to recovery during production incidents? Less than an hour, a few hours, half a day, more than a day, weeks or more. I would say mm. ours is close to less than an hour. I don't know about you. I mean, we're not telling tales out of school here, but we, we I mean, based on my experience and what I've seen us handle, our outages are very short. I mean, yeah, yeah. so. Definitely wide scale ones. Um, yes. Yeah. Now we can't, we can't do everything. So if Cloudflare or like Amazon or, or Azure goes down or something like that, there's kind of have to throw up your hands and like, look, I mean, 
There's, yeah. there's only so much we can do. I mean, you can pick up a phone and call them and say, hey, what's the deal? But uh, yeah. Well, that's the other thing I was thinking when I was reading, hearing the um, the headline of this article, you know, some of the some of the platform and service uh, products that you can that are available these days, you know, they're quite opaque in themselves. So if something, yes. if they're not behaving as you expect, um, and they're not giving you a lot of uh, observability themselves, it'd be pretty challenging sometimes. Yeah, hundred percent. And for those who are curious, we actually do publish the status page. So this is available mm. at status.octopus.com. And you know, if you're ever curious about like incidents that have been reported, yada yada yada, you know, you can go to this website and see them. And uh, we we publish this data, and you can take a look at the historical timeline. You can subscribe to updates. There's lots and lots of ways in which you can view this data. So um, we we utilize observability for this as well. Uh, complexity issues still persist around observability. That's not surprising. Kubernetes has quickly become one of the biggest observability challenges in 2023. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's definitely <laughs> the case. Um, so they list Kubernetes, microservices, serverless, and cloud native architecture as the main concern. After that, scaling and managing open source monitoring tools, lack of knowledge, data security, total cost of ownership, blah, 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 blah. Uh, where do you find the most difficulties when running Kubernetes in production? Security. Networking, I think, is definitely up there as well. Networking is tough, yeah. I find. Security challenges. Security is a top challenge for running Kubernetes in production. Sorry, I interrupted you. I just said complicated security. Oh, networking. The networking is yep. complicated. Yeah, it is. It is. And if it's uh, if it's not DNS, then it's always DNS, right? It's always <laughs> DNS that causes the problem. <laughs> anyway, you can check out this report available up at logs.io. Uh, this is the DevOps Pulse 2023 Observability Trends and Challenges. So I thought that'd be kind of cool. Shifting gears over to HashiCorp. This is a blog post that was recently published around new Terraform integrations from Dell and others. Um, so Terraform has recently just passed, I think, a thousand providers uh, in its marketplace, which is congrats to them. That's awesome. And so you can see the ecosystem around HashiCorp Terraform uh, has just been growing by leaps and bounds. And you can see they have a variety of integrations that have recently come on board. Uh, GitHub app support on Terraform Enterprise, for example. Uh, we've got a bunch of new providers, 16 new verified providers from our partners like Dell, KeyFactor, uh, let's see, Sync, uh, sorry, Sneak, Sync, Sneak, um, Speakeasy, et cetera. So, Lots and lots of cool stuff there, and definitely worth checking out. And then staying with HashiCorp, these are this is an article that talks about Vault. Um, both Terraform uh, and Vault are two integrations that we support, uh, both in product of Octopus and also outside if you're talking about our provider. And so the HashiCorp Vault partner program continues to grow, and you can see there's a new set of Vault integrations. Uh, Vault is a solution for providing uh, credentials, um, and so forth in a secure way. Uh, it's one of many sort of, uh, platforms that are out there. There's a variety of platforms that do that. So some of the, the well-knowns like Honeycomb, Dell, for example, Ping Identity, Susi, um, BuildKite, friends of ours. So, uh, these are new integrations that they have there. So I thought I'd just mention this because, um, yeah, we're fans of HashiCorp and, uh, we use them and it's good to see. Really somewhere people have to be these days, isn't it? Yep, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, if HCL is the uh, fastest growing language on yeah. Terraf or on um, GitHub, then yeah, <laughs> it's important. We haven't talked about Jenkins for a while. Um, I thought I would just mention that they publish a monthly newsletter. So this is an update for what has occurred in the past, say, six weeks or so around Jenkins. And this is their April 2023 newsletter. This was recently published. So in case you were wondering... Um, these are some of the key takeaways. So one security advisor, advisory, excuse me, uh, regarding a plugin, uh, cloud cost controls with improved resource cleanups and VM usage optimization. Thanks to CloudOcean, I like, cl uh, sorry, CloudOcean. <laughs> Thanks to DigitalOcean uh, for their continued support. That's awesome. Uh, new Docker agent images are available. And then they were at CDCon and GitOpsCon. That was an event that recently took care. Uh, took place. So they break it down by section, if you're all curious, and this is an update on what's latest and greatest around the world of Jenkins. God, it's survey after survey. This is all what came up, though. I, I, I guess it must be survey time. But uh, this survey was a survey season. that I saw. What's that? Survey season. 
I know, I know. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of Go. Uh, it's it's used heavily in the cloud native space, and this is a developer survey Q1 results that they published. <laughs> no surprises here. So novice Go developers are interested in web development, error handling, and learning. Uh, our respondents' top challenges. This is a classic one. So this has been around since forever around Go. Error handling is continues to be the bane of its existence, and I think that uh, you know. It will, it, hopefully there will be some work. <laughs> it's like historically lack of generics was the biggest challenge, but now it's, you know, error handling. And I, I would agree with that. So generics was introduced in um, one point. Oh, gosh, one point 14, I want to say, maybe. I yeah. don't know. Question mark. And uh, we use it. We use it in our Terraform provider. We use it in the CLI, the new CLI that we have for our Octopus. Um, so anyways, it's exactly an optimization guide. I'm not interested in Go. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> An optimization guide was the most valuable way to improve Go's performance. There is a um, effective Go guide that they publish off of Go.dev. You can take a look at it if you're at all curious. And then managing dependencies and versionings are the top challenges for open source Go module maintainers. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. When you add new dependencies, adding them is easy. Um, go get and then away you go. But uh, managing and maintaining all those things, um, yeah, I can see. I can see how people might struggle with that. So anyways, this is a report that um, they published, and nice thing is it's all available in HTML uh, as opposed to a PDF. Uh, VS Code, getting some love there. Uh, so you can see, if you're at all interested, take a look at how people are utilizing Go, what they like, what they don't like, that sort of thing. So they've been running the survey for a while now, and uh, I think these surveys are great because they definitely give you some information about what's happening. Did you happen to catch any of the keynotes from Google I.O.? I didn't even know it was on. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Google I.O. recently uh, wrapped up and they had a bunch of keynotes there and you can check them out here. This is at io.google and yes, Google is a TLD slash 2023. <laughs> and uh, there's a bunch of announcements that went around this. They introduced the new Pixel phone. Uh, they introduced um, a bunch of AI and large language model capabilities. Uh, they added they added new capabilities to their tool set. They introduced um, uh, Flutter version 3. Three, or no, it's not Flutter version three. Sorry, Dart version. I don't know why I said Flutter. Dart version three, uh, and uh, and a bunch and a bunch of other stuff. So you can watch all the keynotes uh, from there if you wish, and um, take a look at what was announced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they they break them down based on you know interest level, etc. And so if you're at all interested, I'm a huge fan of Firebase. So props out to the Firebase folks. Um, so Dart version three, I think, dropped earlier today. Uh, lots and lots of stuff there. I, I haven't had a chance to watch all of these. I caught a little bit of the developer keynote. There was a lot of hooping and hollering. Um, it reminded me of an Apple sort of keynote there. A lot of woo, woo, you know, sort of thing. I don't yeah. know why. Like, when did when did keynotes change? Like, I, I, I know I sound at the risk of sounding like an old man. I, I remember developer keynotes from way back when, and there wasn't a lot of, you know, yeah, and high-fiving in the audience. And now, since Apple, I think, it's been like, Kind of like par for the course where you're supposed to like, yes, new text editor and like rush the stage and stuff, you know, so. I'm pretty sure know. our viewers are going to be cheering at home right now. Just listening to you read through the news, John. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, so that's generally all the news and surveys and all that sort of reports that we saw through. This was the last resource I wanted to decide. I thought it was cool. So this is a example of showing you how a page will be fetched byte by byte over TLS. So this page performs a live annotated uh, HPS request uh, for its own source, inspired by the illustrated TLS 1.3 connection guide. It is built purely uh, with JavaScript and it's capturing the TCP traffic. So get this page by byte byte. So there we go. So if you're at all curious at seeing how does a web page uh, get served up via its resources and whatnot, byte by byte, start off with a handshake, which we hopefully do. And this is the record of that handshake, confirming signatures, etc., cetera, uh, trust chains, all that stuff. And then server yeah. returns a response and we parse it. And this is the response. And then for the benefit of a badly written middle boxes that are following along expected a TLS 1.2, the server sends a meaningless cipher change record. And then both sides mm -hmm. are now have everything they do to collaborate and exchange keys, which they do here. And then away we go. And then we encrypt uh, our replies and we start receiving data. And then eventually we decrypt uh, using the handshake key. 
So if you're at all curious, and I I, I recommend this for bedtime reading. You know, if you're <laughs> if you're having trouble falling asleep, this would be something you could take a look at. But uh, this is basically how a page uh, is served up via TLS 1.3. So if you're at all curious, if you want to impress your friends, this would be the page to do it. That is cool. And then you can you know how to speak TLS 1.2. That's it? right. Well, yeah, 1.3. Yes, that's right. And that, as we like to say, wraps it up for another edition of Deploy on Friday. So, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for uh, jumping in, checking us out. If you haven't to stumble upon this video and uh, like what you see, please feel free to like and subscribe to this content. On behalf of Jim, uh, we hope you got something out of this. We'll see you next week on the next edition of Deploy on Friday. See you later.